All right, guys, uh, the next chapter is face and neck injuries, and this one actually won't take uh, very long. There's, there's just a few things we got to be aware of, and uh, for the most part, it's the treatment's the same. It's just go to the hospital. They need a surgeon. They need some pretty advanced stuff, so we're just going to kind of stabilize an evac. So uh, this presentation won't take too long. So uh, one, of the, one of the things we got to know for this chapter is eye stuff, and uh, we got to know some of these terms, okay? So we're familiar with what the iris is or a cornea, pupil, lens. We're going to talk about some differences between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So you got to know that. Um, it actually says right there on the slide, it says anterior compartment filled with aqueous humor, posterior compartment filled with vitreous humor. Okay, so put that in your notes. Uh, that's an important distinction. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that though. So um, vitreous humor is that jelly-like fluid near the back of the eye, okay? And the front of the lens is a fluid called aqueous humor, and that's um, a little bit a little more thinner. So you, there's actually kind of a difference in texture between the vitreous humor and the aqueous humor. So the conjunctiva is the membrane that covers the eye, and it's um, the lacrimal glands produce, uh, the, well, the tears, but when you're not crying, they, they do keep the eye... Uh, moist that is, is needed if the eye dries out um, it'll it'll basically die so um, it does need to stay um, wet so the sclera is the white fibrous tissue that helps maintain the shape so the whites of the eye is also kind of known as the sclera of the eye now but on the front of the eye like where we need to see out of it is replaced by a clear transparent membrane called the cornea okay and that is, well, allows the, the eye to work and uh, light to enter the eye. And the iris itself is a circular muscle behind the cornea, okay? So just be familiar with some of these terms, what the sclera is, what uh, the pupil is, what a cornea is, what the iris is, all that kind of stuff. Just just be familiar with those. Uh, so the pupil, obviously, is, that, is the hole in your eye. That's what we see out of. Um, now, we're going to talk about this a little bit later about looking at eye stuff, eye differences, and kind of uh, assessing for head trauma. Uh, and in, like, unequal pupil sizes is a pretty good way to determine something bad has happened. However, some people do just happen to have different size pupils from birth, and they're okay. And it's called anisocoria. And uh, if you see that in a patient where they've got two different pupil sizes going on, just real quick ask them, like, hey, is that normal for you? Um, because if it is, like, okay. Uh, if it's not, then it's time to go to the hospital. And the lens is just behind the iris, okay, and that's where we intake the light and the information and our brain processes it and then gives it to us. Now the retina uh, contains nerve agents, or nerve endings, um, and that is how it uh, transmits, um, like, basically nutrition, but also information back and forth. Now, if you have a retinal detachment, that's that's pretty much it. Like the retina is a very important part of the eye and uh, without it, you basically can't see. So uh, I threw this in here, not, um, we don't need to know these uh, at our level, but I just wanted to show you guys how, like how the eye works and what the muscles look like. And when we talk about later, we'll talk about doing some eye exams and uh, even the simple exam you've done where it's follow the finger, you know, up, down, left, right. Well, you're actually assessing all these different muscles when you're doing the exam. So uh, you don't need to know these. It's just, just to show you guys that it's actually a pretty complicated um, muscle system. All right, so that's kind of your eye anatomy, but now we'll talk about some of those injuries. So unfortunately, they are pretty common, um, and it can produce lifelong complications, uh, including blindness. So that's why, uh, if you guys have heard that term, life limb or eyesight, it's because, I mean, eyesight really is that important. So... Um, the pupils around usually equal in size and they react to light equally, right? So they should shrink when exposed to light and they'll expand when they're not. And we'll talk about that. Um, so there's, there's Perla is, this is the full test. Okay. It's actually reduced. I've seen it all the way down to just one R and just Pearl. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're comfortable with. It, it, for me, I would want to do this full Perla exam, but I wouldn't necessarily, but I, you don't have to do the accommodation. Part of it but you should at least look at the pupils make sure that they're the same right they're equal they're round they're not teardrop they're not jagged they don't, they don't have any weird shape uh, they react to light so you try and light they shrink 
And then accommodation is just that you can see things close up and far away. So that is, okay, read this book, read this sentence out of a book, and then, okay, read that sign that's down the street, right? So it's, that's measuring the, the eye's ability to, to kind of refract light correctly and actually be able to look at far things and near things. So um, if you can, I would do the full Perla just because that accommodation component is pretty important um, and it's not always included. So uh, injuries of the eyes uh, continuing, so foreign objects. If, you have, if any of you have ever gotten a small object in the eye, um, it, it feels huge, right? But it's, it's very tiny and that's just because our eyes are very sensitive. So the best thing we can do in that situation is just flush it out. So um, you can do a syringe, hopefully without the needle, just in case you don't drop it in the eye, but um, you can do a syringe or right here in this picture, they're using a nasal cannula. They hook it up to the IV and the fluid comes out and, and what they're doing there, and the reason I like this is too, is it basically forces you to do it the right way. Uh, it should be, you should always flush from the inside out, right? So if you went outside and the person's laying on their side, there's a chance that it could drip right back into the opposite eye, right? So you want to, so you want to irrigate from like the nose side out. Um, and I would just hear depending on what that person was exposed to, like sawdust or sand or whatever, uh, you may have to irrigate for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, now, sometimes if they're in there while, especially if the person's blinking and moving their eye around, uh, that can actually cause an abrasion. And we, are, we can call that a corneal abrasion, and there's some tests we can do uh, for that. That does recover, but it's just very painful for the patient. And you may have to flip um, the eyelid over because sometimes the foreign bodies get stuck uh, on the underside of the eyelid. And so you may have to. Uh, the, in the worst case scenario, foreign bodies are going to be impaled in the eye. And that's a very tough uh, situation to, to deal with. Uh, bandage the object in place and support it. So just like we learned from last chapter, if there's any sort of penetration of an object, just, just leave it in there. Any penetrating trauma in the eye, in the anywhere, uh, we generally just want to stabilize it. So here in the eye, uh, shorten if we need to, but um, it's very complicated. You saw all those muscles that were in there. We don't want to be messing around with that. Um, that's like a surgeon thing. So I would st uh, stabilize it. Uh, cover both eyes generally because the eyes move together. So if the left eye is injured and the right eye is open, well, the right eye is going to be up moving around and that the left eye is going to basically do whatever the right eye is doing. So to, to limit some of that trauma with movement, I would cover both eyes. Now, if there's burns, uh, of course, stop the burn of the eye uh, and irrigate. Uh, just that that one's more or less common sense. Just 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 dilute everything. So those are some different ideas, some different ways uh, that you can do it. All right, uh, chemical burns. Generally, we don't want to be forcing the lids open a ton, like just under normal circumstances. But with a chemical burn, you kind of have to. So you want to irrigate that eye for at least five minutes. Um, but if it's something, if it's a hardcore chemical, I would easy 20 minute um, irrigation, especially if you got there, uh, you know, relatively quickly after it happened. You wanted everything you can to flush that out. So I'd give it a uh, Thermal burns. Yeah, generally our eyelid is going to protect us from that a little bit. Um, it still can be some pain and some damage though. Uh, so I would use a sterile dressing. It moistened, it just kind of helps cool it a little bit, cover both eyes, evac. The eyes do recover. Uh, they do heal pretty well one of the fastest repairing uh, organs in our body, tissues in our body, uh, but it still is very painful. So um, just both eyes, sterile dressing with some little, little uh, moisten just so it feels better. That's all you need to do. Um, light burns, well, uh, they're not that painful generally, but they can be, uh, cause a lot of damage. So we want to make sure that if anyone is exposed to a laser or anything like that, uh, we, we need to get them looked out to a um, higher level of care. So lacerations, this is a tough one because the eyeball is a globe, right? It's a circular object and it's, it's meant to stay that way. So there's a laceration. Well, you kind of lose that globe function and then therefore you lose that eye pressure, that interocular eye pressure, um, which is vital for everything working correctly. So if there's any sort of laceration to the eye, that's um, pretty, pretty bad. So we don't want to exert any pressure on the globe because it's already in a weakened state. So we, if the eyeball is exposed, we want to prevent drying, and that's fine. Um, and we want to cover the per, 
So the difference between like, for example, we just talked about in this is you actually want to have like an eye shield, like um, a little metal uh, disc almost that covers the entire eye. And so that way there's no pressure on the actual eyeball. It's just, it's all, the pressure is all on the bony structures of the body. Now, if the eyeball is come out of its socket, which has happened, uh, I've heard some stories of people where they've had to encounter that. Uh, very complicated. Do not attempt to reposition it. Uh, you saw how all those muscles were in the retina and everything. It's very complicated. So cover the eye, stabilize it, uh, keep it moist, right? We don't want that eye drying out. Cover both eyes and uh, have them lie on their back and get to a hospital. All right. Um, now, blunt trauma. So this is, uh, you know, getting punched or baseball bat or whatever it is. Um, it can, one of the telltale signs of that is a hyphema, which is a pooling or collection of blood inside the anterior chamber of the eye. And actually on the email, I'll send you guys a good video of, about all this, but basically the anterior chamber of your eye, you can actually see it from across the room, ha like almost half the, um, the chamber is full of blood. And so it's like slowly rising to the level of the people. Now there's different levels of uh, hyphemas and we don't need to know that, just know that a collection of blood in the anterior chamber of the eye is a hyphema. Uh, an orbit fracture is a fracture of the bones that form the eye floor and support the globe. So orbit fractures can be pretty tough too because they help stabilize the eyeball and allow it to move. So if you have that underlying structural support system that's been damaged, um, that can also cause some eye issues as well. And then retinal detachments are often seen in sports that kind of blunt impact can detach it. So the things that we are going to be worrying about when we uh, respond to any sort of uh, patient treatment situation is going to be if one pupil is larger than the other. Now, remember, we got to ask that question if that's normal for them. Uh, but if one pupil is larger than the other, that generally means um, it can either be an eye injury, it can be in, uh, increased intracranial pressure, it can be quite a few things. So either way, serious. Eyes not moving together, that might mean that you have uh, you have some sort of failure in the muscle system uh, from that earlier picture, just like failure of the eyes to follow your finger. Um, there might be some sort of uh, detachment or, or muscle problem. Uh, bleeding under the conjunctiva uh, or protrusion or bulging of the eye, both those are um, something that really needs like a surgeon or some, some pretty advanced level of care. All right, now blast injuries. Uh, it can be severe pain all the way to foreign bodies to everything. If there's a foreign body, do not remove it, just like we talked about. And it depends if you're, what they're saying here is if only one eye is injured, follow protocol. And that is follow like the protocols of your agency. Um, from me, like in the military standpoint, if you're engaged in a firefight and there's there's bad guys running around, you might actually leave that eye open. Um, just because now at least that person can walk on their own, that kind of thing. But if you have to close both eyes, that person's 100% liability, right? They don't know where the doors are. They don't know, they don't know where they're going. Uh, it's a lot more risky to have a, effectively blind patient in combat than it is with one eyed um, who's injured. So certain situations are going to be that. However, um, most of the time, you know, here in, in EMS world, uh, just cover both eyes and you don't have to worry about. Now, if there's a contact lenses, a lot of people are still wearing those. Um, generally, we want to leave, leave them in unless there's a chemical burn because some of the chemical can get trapped underneath that. Um, and now you have another variable inside the, the, the weird chemistry equation that's happening. Now you have this weird contact lens in there. And so definitely want to remove that in a chemical burn. Um, there for hard contact lenses, you don't really see those a ton anymore, but there is a special suction cup. Uh, but otherwise, um, normal soft contact lenses, um, you know, you just basically get your eyes a little wet with staline so it's not totally dry. And then you basically just pinch out the, uh, the contact. All right, nosebleeds. So epitaxis is the uh, medical word for, for that. Um, one of the most common causes is digital trauma. It's people hurting themselves with their fingers. Um, anterior nosebleeds usually originate from the area of the septum and bleed slowly. Um, now, posterior nosebleeds are more severe and they usually have blood going to the back of the throat. Now, anterior nosebleeds bleed slowly. Obviously, you've probably seen some pretty bad um, nosebleeds and that's even though it looks like it's fast it's actually still pretty slow compared to a posterior nosebleed some posterior nosebleeds actually have arterial involvement uh, which is a little bit different than like almost like a venous bleed or something near the septum 
So uh, if you have that nosebleed, you just want to pinch the nosebleed and the patient forward and, and hope that the body can clot it off. Now, one test you might want to do, and this isn't a trauma, so if someone maybe hit their face, hit their head, and now they have a nosebleed and they're having some other uh, um, head injury signs and symptoms. So cerebral spinal fluid is supposed to be in our cranium. If there's a fracture at the base of the skull or anywhere in there, some of that cerebral spinal fluid can actually drip into the blood. Now, and, and if, when it's the blood's coming out, you're not going to know what's what. But there's a, something called a halo test where you take a few drops of the blood and you put it on a gauze, 4 by 4 gauze, and you let it sit for a few minutes. And if there's CSF in it, the CSF is going to form this halo around the blood. And that's usually indicative of that cerebral spinal fluid. That means we have a pretty serious fracture. So just be aware of what that is. All right, one of the last things we're going to talk about is going to be the ear. And it's divided into our three parts, outer, middle, and inner. Um, I would know this. This is a, this is kind of a, a fun uh, vocab things that sometimes um, I'll either test or that the National Registry will. Um, just know that the, the middle ear has the hammer and the anvil, and then it has the cochlea and all that. So just, just be a little bit familiar with this uh, picture, just so you know where some of the pieces are. Um, they are, the yeah, other ears are injured a lot, especially in uh, certain contact sports, but they don't usually bleed a ton. Now, in the case of an ear avulsion, which is where the ear has been like partially ripped off, moist cereal dressing and put in a plastic bag if you need to, and then just, just secure it to the head. And then once again, uh, just, just like we talked about the halo test for the, for the nose, same idea with the ear. So if there's lots of fluid coming out of the ear, you can do a little halo test on that too and figure out if there's a fracture. Um, all right, facial fractures in general. So there's actually something called the fork fractures, and it's, it's a way of uh, discerning the different types of fractures uh, within, within our face. So uh, you got, I, I'll post a video, I'll send a video out with all that so you guys can watch that. Um, same idea, you don't necessarily need to know what a Lafort 1 versus a Lafort 2 is, but just be, just be familiar with what it is. The facial fracture is called a Lafort fracture. That might be like an advanced level question on the National Registry. So just, just be aware of Lafort fracture is a facial fracture. Okay. Um, they're not necessarily an acute emergency unless there's serious bleeding or an airway compromise. Um, these days, plastic surgeons can do some pretty amazing stuff, and they can, they can get to it without 7 to 10 days. All right, so dental injuries. I also have a little a video about this. Um, basically, you want to apply jerk pressure just right to that socket where the uh, tooth is gone. And just uh, suction if you need to, if there's a lot of blood, and um, just get them out of there. So now, if you can find the tooth and it's like an adult, you can potentially put that tooth actually back in the mouth. So you want to handle it by the top of the tooth, like the part that we see, not the root. And you can place it in milk or sterile saline or water. Honestly, I'd place, I mean, if I had water, whatever, I, I would place it in whatever I could, uh, even if it's water, um, even if it's tap water. That's better than nothing. Um, notify the hospital, re-implantation re recommended, Pretty quickly though, okay? So if you have an avulsed tooth and you're gonna put that in some milk or some water or something cool, but this is like an emergency, like he, we gotta get this guy working on him right now. All right, so we talked about this in the last chapter. Um, basically, um, really we wanna leave the object impaled in there unless it's uh, somehow getting in the way of our, of our ABCs. So try to do a crush, see what you can do. All right. Um, Injuries of the neck, so any sort of blunt trauma uh, or even penetrating trauma in, in anywhere in our neck can, can, inj can injure any one of these. So uh, our upper airway esophagus, our carotid arteries, jugular veins, those are scary things to injure. Uh, the thyroid cartilage is also known as the Adam's apple. Uh, cricoid cartilage, a little bit underneath that, and then the upper part of the trachea. Okay, so those are all things that can get injured. You can actually um, injure a trachea uh, with with 10 to 15 pounds of force um, depends on who, what articles you're reading but um, it doesn't actually take a lot to crush that trachea now if there's a, a blast or i mean a blunt injury so right there in the, in the trachea right in our neck area it might actually um, have somehow injured the voice box or something so that's that's a, maybe a clue that there's some pretty serious neck trauma if they, they can barely speak
Now, subcutaneous emphysema is kind of like skin, or I mean air underneath the skin, and it kind of makes this gross crackling sensation. It's um, it's almost like uh, the, the the packaging bubbles you can you can pop. It's almost like that, where it's just little thin layers of air are trapped underneath the skin, and you can see that, and that would be coming out of the neck. That's obviously a very uh, important indicator of some sort of serious trauma happened if you see subcutaneous emphysema. That's another that's another uh, buzzword you might want to write down in your notes. Just just knowing that subcutaneous emphysema is air under the skin. Um, so we we already kind of talked about this uh, respiratory distress, hoarseness, pain, difficulty swallowing, cyanosis, pale skin, uh, sputum in the wound. Those are all things that are that are indicative of a relatively serious uh, laryngeal injury. Uh, subcutaneous emphysema we just talked about bleeding, bruising the neck, all that stuff. So. If you see any of those symptoms, uh, Sandra's symptoms, definitely stop messing around and get to the hospital as quickly as possible. That's definitely a load and go uh, situation. So um, I hope everybody's having a great time um, down at, in our little quarantine lives now. Um, I will keep sending these videos out um, over the weekend. I'm also working with the publisher of the textbook to give you guys basically an online version of the textbook. Um, just to kind of just just a little extra something besides me just talking in the homework okay so it'll take a few days for us to get all the the uh, all that stuff figured out but I expect by next week I will have an online textbook uh, component for you guys to um, play around with and they and they got uh, puzzles and and crosswords and matching exercises and different things it's a pretty useful uh, thing so uh, I will keep you guys posted with that so um, Keep watching these videos, keep reviewing the homework, and I'll talk to you guys next week.